Hello, welcome to Pro Bono, sponsored by Cahoon Legal. I'm your host, Amber Cahoon. I'm an attorney in North Texas. New podcasts are available monthly, and you can subscribe on most podcast platforms. Find us by following at Pro Bono Show. Remember, this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered legal advice. It is not intended to replace professional legal advice. And this information is catered toward Texans with a focus on Texas law. What we have for you today is about contracts. So we're going to briefly discuss verbal contracts, written contracts. There is a non-compete ban. What to do if you've signed a non-compete. Another segment that I'm starting, and we may not do it in every podcast, but fact or fiction. So basically covering something that maybe most people believe to be true or false. And I'll tell you if it legally is true or false um, for Texas, at least. And then I'll talk about some personal thing before we end. So verbal contracts in Texas, a verbal contract is valid. And that would mean that there is no writing, you know, regarding the terms of the contract. A good example of a verbal contract is some person walking around the neighborhood, uh, knocking on your door and asking to, you know, pull your weeds, let's say, <clears throat> and you agree on the spot and he's going to come the next day to pull the weeds and you've agreed to a price. So you have an offer, which is him saying, Hey, I'll pull your weeds. You accept. And what the compensation is would be you know, if $10 an hour, um, that is the consideration for the agreement. <clears throat> All um, contracts, whether they're verbal or written, need to have an offer, an acceptance, consideration. Those are just some of the bare bones to be valid. There's some other stuff um, that's just more detailed, but um, you have to have those kind of basic three to be even the start of whether it's a valid contract or not. And we do those type of contracts all the time. Um, valid contracts are hard to prove um, at times in court, and so they can be somewhat problematic. But depending on the size and you know the amount of damages or money involved, uh, a lot of times verbal contracts can be proven by the acts of each party. So for instance, if you have you know proof or someone else was there when they saw him come up, and then you're pulling your weeds the next day and then he comes to you for payment and you're like, no, we didn't have an agreement. I'm not going to pay you. You know, he could get evidence that he had pulled your weeds. That's just a really simplistic, you know, example. But verbal contracts can be shown a lot of times through the actions of the parties um, after the fact but they are very hard to prove in court. And so usually, and I know for myself when I was doing litigation, um, a verbal contract was not one that I would feel comfortable going to court on. So again, a verbal contract needs an offer, the acceptance, and then consideration. Consideration is either the money or anything of value. So when he offered to do the service of pulling the weeds, that is what he is giving a value. And then the other party or the homeowner would be giving the value of the money. Um, and that would make it a legally enforceable contract. So let's turn now to written contracts. Um, that is the bulk of the contracts that people um, have. And there are particular contracts in Texas that must be in writing to be enforceable. One of which is a will or a trust. Um, the debt for another person or a default of another person that must be in writing a marriage, um, except if in Texas we do have common law, which I'm not going to get into that. Um, if you are selling any piece of real estate, so any property, whether it's a home land, and that must have a contract for the sale of that property, it cannot be verbal. The contract, um, if it's going to last more than a year from the date of the agreement, um, and that's usually where those fall in, not everyone, but like a tenancy or a lease that you have, a rental agreement. Um, if that's going to be more than a year, you have to be in writing. If it is something that's an obligation that's going to be paid out over a course of a year or actions that are going to um, occur according to the contract are happening over many years, that has to be in writing. 
And then, like I said, a real estate lease for more than a year must be in writing. I always believe, and it's very legally sound to always have any real estate lease, rental agreement to be in writing, even if it's under a year. If you have an oil and gas mining lease, those must be in writing. An agreement or a warranty um, to cure made by a healthcare provider about medical care. Um, if you are selling any securities, that must be in writing. And then if you're selling a good or, or some sort of thing of value for $500 or more, that must be in writing. So with a written contract, you can have a lot of different terms. But essentially, just as with a verbal agreement, you're going to have the offer, you're going to have the acceptance, and you're going to have the consideration given by each party, what each party is giving up a value um, for this contract. And then contracts have a lot of different provisions that affect it, um, whether there's a termination clause, a waiver, what state that the law will govern the contract. So in Texas, if you're signing a contract, but it's governed by New York law, then potentially you could be sued in New York or it would be in Texas, you would be sued, but they'd have to apply New York law. So there are things in a contract that if you do not understand it, you need to really get you know, strong legal advice to explain it to you. That's one thing that I am very concerned with with my clients. I want anyone that is signing a contract or considering signing a contract to understand it. And I want to make sure they've read it. And then we go through it, um, each provision, because there are lots of provision which seem just standard, like waiver or jurisdiction or choice of law. These are things that are covered a lot in different contracts, but they have a lot of effect on the future of those contracts. And so if you don't understand that, it may be very detrimental to you if you go ahead and sign it without understanding. So that's a big important thing is that you understand the contracts that you're signing, if there's auto renewals, um, anything like that, so that you know really what you're giving up because that's what it is. You're, it's a value that you're giving up or you're paying. Some people think that if they have a written contract, then that is protection and that that ensures that what they have paid to get done or, you know, or paid for um, will happen. But really a contract is just the agreement. And if it doesn't happen or if someone has breached the agreement, then you have to go to court to really have that enforced. Um, and Texas courts will primarily let you contract or put in your terms anything that is legal. So you can't put illegal terms or provisions that aren't allowed by law, but really if, if uh, agreement is very heavy handed on one side, they'll allow that. If you've agreed to it and you've signed it, and these are things that you always have to consider with employment agreements or contracts, real estate or contractors to build a home or whatever it is. Because if you don't understand and you just think, oh, well, a court would never make me do that. If it's in the agreement and you've signed it, they will. And it's very costly um, to go to court to enforce a contract. And so you really want to make sure that there's no ambiguity. There's no vagueness in the contract. Um, that each party understands all of their duties and responsibilities um, to ensure that each party knows and that they can be held accountable for those things. Okay, now we're going to talk about non-compete agreements. In 2024, earlier in the year, um, there was talk amongst the labor department that they were going to ban non-competes. And then in April, the actual um, Federal Trade Commission issued a rule, which it says are, is to promote competition. It's banning non-competes nationwide. They believe that it protects the fundamental freedom of workers to change jobs, increasing innovation, and fostering new business formation. This is from the Federal Trade Commission. And so what is happening is that you have all of these agreements prior to this rule coming down that a lot of them have non-competes, especially employment agreements, or if you've sold a business and the 
you know, the buyers have put a non-compete in there so that you don't open up a competing business after they purchased it. So there are non-competes in all different areas, but primarily um, employment law. So right now, the rule is a federal rule. It is being challenged. But in general, if you have signed a non-compete agreement, and sometimes it's not just called a non-compete, it's within some other agreement, so maybe a severance or some other employment agreement that you've signed, or like I said, a selling a business or buying a business, and it had a non-compete provision in it, and you're not sure if that's enforceable, then I strongly urge you to reach out to an attorney to get guidance so they can read through it. They can give you the most up-to-date information about whether or not this is um, enforceable still. So basically, the FTC new rule says that existing non-competes for the vast majority of workers will no longer be enforceable after the effective date of that rule. There are some non-competes which are for senior executives and they have to meet a specific threshold um, to be considered are still enforceable. But most others are not enforceable according to this rule. As I said, it is being challenged. But at this point, the guidance is, is that they may not be enforceable. Another thing is that in Texas, a non-compete has to fit certain elements um, and restrictions already to be enforceable. So you may have a non-compete in your agreement, but if it's not written properly, um, according to law, it may not already be um, enforceable. And so if you're not sure, as I said, contact an attorney. But if you're a business owner or you're looking to buy a business and you're wanting to you know, have some sort of protection um, for your business, there are definitely alternatives to non-competes, including trade secrets, confidentiality agreements, non-disclosure agreements, non-solicitation agreements. There's a lot of provisions that you can have that can protect you and your business. Um, and it's very important to talk to a, if it's an employment area, employment attorney, contract attorney, business attorney, to make sure that those are included and that you understand them and how to protect your interest the best way. Um, so reach out to an attorney, provide them with the document because really until they've read it, um, they're not going to fully be able to advise you. Um, not every contract is the same. Um, they actually need to read it to uh, make sure that they're giving you the proper advice. So the next section um, is fact or fiction. So on this one, we're talking about a three-day rescission, or if you've ever heard of, it's like, well, I have three days to cancel my contract, right? In Texas, that's not necessarily the case. So for purchases, you know, at your normal, you know, box store, um, they will have their own policy for refunds and stuff of that nature. And some things, if it's like it's an open package, they won't accept it. And that is perfectly acceptable. That's all within their rules. Um, so there's not a overarching law that says that if you purchase something that you have three days to cancel that. So there are a few instances where you would have the right to cancel a purchase within three days. And that is if the seller solicits you as the buyer at a place other than their place of business. For example, if they're selling goods or services at a temporary location, an event, or the buyer's home. So you think of like door-to-door -door salesmen or something to that effect. Problem is they're at a temporary location and if you've signed something and it doesn't provide a lot of information about how to contact them, it might be hard to figure out how to cancel within those three days. So if that is something that you are thinking that you might need to do, you need to make sure you understand how do I cancel. So these are the consumer's right to cancel a transaction. And it's important to know that the merchant or the seller actually has to have information required by law um, on their contracts or in, um, I guess, any documentation that they have. And it must be bold face and a minimum size, and it has to have a specific statement, which is required in the law um, in the statute. So it's important that if it's something that you think you might have to cancel, usually it needs to be upwards of $25 or more in that transaction, then 
as I said, make sure you know how to cancel that. Um, the law states that you have up to midnight on the third business day after the date that you signed the agreement or the offer to purchase. So again, if that's a little confusing or you want to make sure, always reach out to an attorney. Now I want to spotlight a application that we use in our office called Slack. We had previously used Teams, Microsoft Teams, to communicate through messages um, internally um, in our office, and then they decided to start charging. And so we found Slack. Um, and it is just Slack, S-L-A-C-K dot com. And it is similar to um, lots of different software to um, communicate between team members. I used it many, many years ago in another um, job before I was an attorney, actually as a project manager. And we used it a lot because it had a lot of um, integration for setting up tasks and all that kind of stuff. I don't use that as much now. Um, we use it a lot for quick questions um, or different things, but I actually use it for my staff and then any outside parties that also have Slack. We can send quick messages to each other. There are a lot of things that are, you know, functions in it that we probably don't even use. And I know that other businesses use it and there's a lot of, you know, just productivity tools in it and it has a lot of solutions. So I highly recommend you using it. So we use the free version because we haven't had a need to upgrade, but you know, you may like the free version or try an upgraded version, but I definitely would um, recommend checking it out for your organization. So now to talk about um, a little more about me personally, um, I know I've talked about my family. Um, we have three kids, my husband and I, and then I have two stepkids who are now adults um, and they have their own families and um, we like to travel. So over the last couple of years, I have tried to incorporate travel to different places. So we went to San Diego for our anniversary. We went to Seattle and Portland. Um, and I say that because I saw on my computer years ago, I like looking at nature. So a picture came up of what's called Haystack Rock in Cannon Beach, um, which is in Oregon. And I just thought it was just breathtaking. And uh, we made plans to go there in a couple of years. And we did it last year. So that's really exciting. We have been to Colorado a lot. Um, I have family um, in Wisconsin. So we've been there. And we've done it where we've driven or flown. Um, so we've gotten to go through the states. I think we've been to St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and then we also have family and a place to stay in Florida on the West Coast uh, in St. Pete's Beach or um, kind of outside of Tampa. We took the kids on two different occasions to Disney um, World. My oldest two kids, when they were little, um, we took them. And then again, we went um, when our three um, were a little, I think my youngest was like four or five. Um, and my stepson and uh, our three kids. And my husband and I all went um, to Florida and we went to Disney World and we went to see the Star Wars um, park. I don't know what it's called, um, but our family is a big Star Wars watcher. Um, we watched all of them. We watched all the, you know, sideshows of, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that was a really cool experience. Um, we've also been to SeaWorld out there, um, which is beautiful and so neat. Um, but this time we are going to Charleston, South Carolina. Um, we have never been there. And so we're very excited to go to the East Coast and see the Atlantic Ocean and bring the family out there. Um, if you've been to Charleston and you just have a wonderful place that you think we should go and see, please email because I would love to um, get some recommendations. My parents have been there and so I have some recommendations from them. But we're going to be there about five days. So I'm really excited. Um, I think we also might drive down to Savannah, Georgia, I think. Um, I am not great with geography. So um, those are things we're going to be doing over the summer in addition to enjoying our pool. And the kids have different sports stuff that they're doing. Um, 
you have probably heard my dog whining because my children are outside and he wants to go outside. Um, it's our new puppy, which is a year old. He is such a water dog. He's been getting in the pool and going after balls and the pool rings and stuff like that. And so um, it'll be really exciting um, to enjoy the summer um, with him. And then also when we're traveling, um, I encourage you guys to travel. Um, even in Texas, when we were right before COVID hit, we went and did, um, we went to Austin and then we went to San Antonio and we went to Houston. And, um, it was before we even knew, um, of COVID. It was like every morning we would get up and have the free breakfast and we would see on the news, this stuff was happening. And it was like, following us around. And then we finally got back home and everything was on lockdown. So we were really fortunate to have made that trip right before Texas was locked down um, due to COVID. Um, when I was in law school and funds were not um, very readily available, um, I planned a free a two day trip to Waco, Texas, and they have a lot of free museums and different things there, um, you know, to check out. And if you're in Dallas, Fort Worth, there's a lot of things here. So um, I just encourage you, there's a lot of ways to travel and experience things and learn about your culture and learn about other cultures. I just, I love it. I caught the bug in college when my mom um, let me go to Germany and I was there for 10 weeks um, and it was the best experience ever. And so I hopefully next year will be taking our kids on an international trip. Um, before my oldest graduates, but um, I encourage you to explore. Um, explore and see how beautiful our planet is. That's all for Pro Bono. Thank you for listening. I hope you learned more about legal topics that can help you in your daily life. Please share with friends and family and send any questions you have that you want me to cover in future episodes. Next month, we will be discussing probate. Have a great day.